get into the message today. This is part two. I'm talking about the whole armor of God. I'm in Ephesians 6. And today I want to talk about the breastplate of righteousness. And this is part of the armor. The armor isn't just there for you to be in a defense. It is for defense, but it, it's also for offense. And as you put on the whole armor of God, you're actually getting in agreement with God for the purpose and the thing that he's called for you to do. See, without this armor, you're going to be open to the enemy's attacks. You're going to be open to get your, for lack of better words, butt whooped by the devil. He'll deceive you. He'll get you off course. He'll get you hanging out in the wrong place at the wrong time, and you'll be disconnected from God's purpose and destiny. And you can waste your life being disconnected from God. You'll get older. You'll spend your money. You'll have your time go by. Some of us, you know, lose certain things. And at the end of that journey, if you don't get connected with God and what he wants for your life, it'll be a waste. And that's the reality. That's, that's not, you know, I'm not trying to be heavy this morning. It's the reality. We have a responsibility to get in agreement with God. Before I get into the message, I wanted to kind of share a little bit with the way that I minister. I have a, a specific style, whatever. Everybody's got their own flow, their own style. I kind of wanted to share with you what I feel like my job is here. In 2 Timothy 2, if you have that verse, if you can bring that up. And starting in verse 14, it says, Remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit, to the ruin of the hearers, but be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So I don't go through, you know, and there's times where I will, I'll, I'll go through the chapter, verse, and we'll just kind of, you know, Bible study style. But a lot of times I'm going in and I'm looking at how can I rightly divide and expound and, and bring out the, the word of God. But I don't just use one scripture. I try to bring other scriptures to support what I'm saying because the Bible says let two or three right witness establish, let a truth be established. So when I'm talking about righteousness this morning, I'm not just reading over and saying, okay, hey, put on the breastplate of righteousness. I want to take that theme of righteousness and then bring other scriptures in to kind of fill out so that you can see what I'm talking about. Really, ultimately, what I believe God's wanting to speak to you. And it's not just some message I'm thinking, what would be a great thing for me to say to these people today? No, but God, what are you speaking? What do you want them to hear? And God, that that, that would be the voice that y'all hear, not my voice. And whatever's not of God would fall by the wayside, but what is of his spirit would go forth and not return void, but actually go in and accomplish what it's supposed to do. That you would get in, in agreement with the word of God for your life and then see God move in your life. Amen? So, Lord, bless this word this morning. I ask, God, that you would just equip us this morning. Let us walk out of here knowing that we have the breastplate of righteousness at our disposal, Lord, that we're righteous because of what you did on the cross, that we can walk in that with boldness and courage, that we don't have to be ashamed, but we can walk in the forgiveness that you've provided, in the grace that you've provided. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's go ahead. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. We talked about this last week. In the power of his might, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles. We talked about how the enemy works. He's a deceiver. He's got different tactics, but he doesn't really have that many. His main tactic is deception. He likes to lie. He likes to give you half-truths and then use that to manipulate us, to get us to do his will instead of God's will. For we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. That our fight isn't natural, but it's supernatural. And that God wants to empower us with his, with his spirit and his love to take on the enemy and see the enemy defeated in people's lives. So that people aren't walking around busted and, and defeated and destroyed in their spiritual life, in their spiritual walk, but that they're victorious, that they're courageous, that, that when you see them, they have a fire and a fervor, but they're not walking around like this, like hopeless, 
Like there's, they have no future, that they have no, they, they look at their life and they feel like, oh, geez, it'd be better to just end it instead of looking at their life and seeing the future that God has for them, seeing the purpose of, of the pain and the purpose of what they go through, that it actually is there to purify and transform them and as they cling to the Lord. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to, to withstand in what? The evil day. Let me tell you, the day is getting evil and more evil as we progress into the future. We're seeing things around us. It's just more wicked. You hear it in the news. That doesn't mean that God's not working. God's, there's good things going on. But you can tell that the pressure in the devil, he only has but a little bit of time. And so as the time comes to a close, he's doing as much damage as he can. That's why we need to be strong in the Lord. And to be able to stand in the evil day, we have to put on this whole armor. And having done all to stand, we stand, therefore, girding our waist with truth. We talked about truth last week. And having put on the breastplate of righteousness. And that's where we're going to stop. The breastplate of righteousness. We are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 5. And it says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. I love this right here. And I'm going to bring this out a little bit in another verse. But it says, we are ambassadors. So ambassadors are represent representatives of another country, right? So we're ambassadors of what? Of the kingdom of God. That now that we're, we've been taken out of the kingdom of the world in darkness, and we've been put in the kingdom of light and righteousness and truth, and God has given us an assignment, and now we're just sojourners. We're passing through. This ain't our final home. We're here on assignment. We have a purpose from the king. Every single one of us has been given an assignment. And if we don't know what that is, that's where we have to press in into the things of God and into the word of God. Until the spirit of God illuminates it in your spirit. And you say, you know what? I, I really have this strong desire to adopt this little baby. I don't know what it is, but I got I to gotta do this. And you can't get away from it. Or, or it's start a ministry. Or it's tell somebody at work about the Lord. Whatever it is that God begins to put these burdens or these, these things on our life where we start thinking about, you know, be really, I just really have always wanted to do this in, with my life. And it has something to do with God and his kingdom. Let me tell you right now, that's the spirit of God speaking to you. Because the devil's not going to tell you, hey, do something for God. <laughs> in fact, he's going to tell you the opposite and try to deceive and come in and tempt you and, and lead you away from that. We are ambassadors for Christ as though God were what? Pleading through us. Meaning God is actually in you and wanting to work through your life. That is such a, if you just sit and have a revelation of that. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That we're actually set apart. We are children of the most high God. That we represent his kingdom. That we have his truth on the inside of us. And wherever we go, he goes with us. And that kingdom authority that, that he's given us goes with us. That means this, that the authority of this world, they don't have it over on us. Because God's the true authority. Even Jesus, right before he goes to the cross, he surrendered and submitted himself to death. And he's sitting there with, I think it was Pontius Pilate, and he's like, I, I could call a bunch of angels right now, and they can come and rescue me and deliver me from your hand right now. But that wasn't the will of God for his life. The will of God for his life was to die so that he would gain all of us, that we would be adopted, that we would represent, that we would stand in his righteousness. Which really, what is that word? Righteousness, right standing with God. There's no hostility between you and God. God looks at you and he doesn't go, oh my gosh, you sinful, horrible, foul creature. Be gone. Poof, it destroy you, right? Back in the Old Testament, you read some stories of God being like, and everybody gets wiped out because they're sinful or they're, they're not connected with God and his kingdom. 
Jesus came to pay the price to, to do away with that. So that now we have this boldness that we can approach the throne of God by grace to enter into this place to go, like, okay, God, doesn't matter where I came from, doesn't matter where I was born, doesn't matter all the sin, all the mistakes I've made. It doesn't matter. What matters is I'm righteous and I'm pure and I'm showing up for my assignment. Lord, what do you want me to do? I'm a soldier in an army now. I have, I have an assignment to accomplish. And this is why we need people who have the call of ministry to, to, to disciple and to form and to fashion people into what God has called them to be. That God will use us. Because how many know you get baby Christians and they're still walking around with, the, with that identity of the world or the past or what they've been through. You can always meet somebody who's had a hard time, had a rough time in, in life, and the next thing you know, you try to talk to them, but they're so wrapped up in their past and what they've done and how they've, met, how they've failed. Their identity's so in the past, and they start, and then you start getting down to the, you know, those bitter places and the things that have been done to them, and the victim, and their, they've been beaten, they've been abused, or whatever, and that becomes their identity, and the next thing you know, every time you try to, oh, you don't know, you don't know what I've been through. You don't know who I am, right? And sometimes it's a threat. You don't know who I am. If you really knew, I killed people. <laughs> you know, I mean, really? Is that what you're saying? You don't know who I am? What, what are you saying? You're going to kill me? The reality of it is, is that they get so stuck in an identity. Sometimes it's, right, we don't know where I'm from. I mean, I grew up in L.A., so I, I got a, I, man, I used to run into people all the time. And in fact, if you were on the streets, they'd come up and ask you, where are you from? You know, where are you from, Holmes? What set you claim? Right, the whole gang thing, the whole gangster thing. And what, what's your experience? Oh, yeah, you don't know what I've been through? Had my older brother pick on me and beat me and call me a sissy my whole life. So now I have an insecurity problem and I got to act tough. And that's the reality of where people are, but they don't know. They're just operating out of their past. And the next thing you know, you have a society who actually glorifies violence. What did you, oh, I've robbed some people, I beat some people up, I stole from them. Really? Wow, you're really hard, you're really cool. And now you're really in prison for the rest of your life. It's foolish, that's where the devil comes in and he deceives people. He gets them looking at something going, wow, when in reality that is the end of that is death. The end of it is destruction. The end of it is separation from your purpose and your calling and what God really had for you. And that's why we come with a message and we say, look, Jesus died for all your mistakes. He died for everything. He died for that where you're from. It doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter where you come from. All of us come to him the same way. Little human being, big God who's holy and righteous. And if he wanted to, destroy us all he could. So I come before the throne of grace with boldness, but also there's a little bit of a, you know, fear of the Lord. Like, God, I know if you could take me out if you wanted to. In fact, there's, there's a time where he's coming in his righteousness to bring judgment. That's biblical. He's going to return, and all those who rejected him, and all those who said, ah, who needs God? Who, uh, screw God. And God's coming in his righteousness to bring judgment because he's pure, he's holy. Let's go to Isaiah 64. It says, oh, that you would rend the heavens, that you would come down, that the mountains might shake at your presence. As fire burns brushwood, as fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, that the nations may tremble at your presence. When you did awesome things for which we did not look, you came down. The mountains shook at your presence. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, nor has I seen any God beside you who acts for the one who waits for him. You meet him, with, you meet him who rejoices and does righteousness, who remembers you in your ways. You are indeed angry, for we have sinned. In these ways we continue, and we need to be saved. But we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. 
And there is no one who calls on your name, who stirs himself up to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have consumed us because of our iniquities. But now, O Lord, you are our father. We are the clay. You are the potter. And all we are, and all of us are the work of your hand. Without God, we are, he created us, right? He created us to, in his image to be holy and righteous. When sin came in, it separated us from God. It made us unclean to God. So the plan of God was to have Jesus come and, and redeem and make a way for us to now what? Be restored back to that place of righteousness before him where he's not looking at your failures and your mistakes and now communicating or identifying with you with those things. In fact, the closer you get to God, the more he pushes those things out of your life. He exposes the sin. He exposes the areas where we're, where we're disobedient. But it takes us getting in agreement with him for him to do the work. The Holy Spirit does the work on the inside of us. So let's say you get saved and you, you had a, a bad past and God says, okay, now you're forgiven. Well, let's say because your mind's not renewed, you go back to the same thing. And next thing you know, you make a mistake. You end up back in a place where you're like, oh, my gosh, I gave my life to the Lord and I'm right back doing the thing I shouldn't have been doing. Well, why is that? Because we haven't been conformed. We haven't learned how to be disciplined and to be a soldier and, and be a disciple of the Lord. We've allowed life and just who we are to do it instead of letting God come in and have his way and be Lord over our life. This call to have a relationship with God is more than just fire insurance, more than just, which I've said this a lot, it's more than just you coming in and saying, I need Jesus because I messed up and I've made mistakes and I need forgiveness. It's more than, like, he forgives you. He paid the price for forgiveness, but that resurrection life is the extra. It's the cherry on top. It's now you get to live on purpose for God on assignment in this earth where there's still darkness and wickedness and evil that's running rampant, right? And now God says, hey, I've saved you. I've redeemed you. Now I'm going to equip you and I'm going to give you an assignment on the earth to fulfill. And you get to do that not because you're a sinner, not because you're so uh, awesome in your own right, you know, or, or religious because you went to, you know, some people who go to church are whole lot, well, I've never done anything wrong. I've just gone to church and I've done perfect. So God's going to use me because I'm great. You know, no, no, it doesn't matter. God's not looking at your, at your religious duties and, and saying, okay, you're great. Now I'll use you. In fact, like I just read, our righteousness is as filthy rags. There's nothing we can do out of our own effort and strength and the flesh to please God. It's our faith that pleases him. In Galatians 3, and then I'll come back to this uh, Hebrews, but in Galatians it says, Oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? That you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the spirit by having the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish having begun in the spirit? Are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Therefore, know that only those who are of faith are the sons of Abraham. In the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, in you all the nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. Your righteousness is by faith. Anything that you receive, your assignment, your calling, your family, your, your children, everything, all that you do with God comes from this place of faith. How you obey God is faith. Right? How... Faith is the thing that counts unto you righteousness. I believe Jesus died, therefore I'm righteous. Why? Because I believe. I have faith. I know God's not hostile towards me because if he was, guess what? I would not be able to approach him. 
If I lived in my mind all day about all the stuff I did and wrong, and that's how I continue to live, or where I messed up, and that's, that's my mindset, my, that mindset is going to push me away from God. Because I feel shame, I feel misery, I feel like I can't do it, I feel like, oh, life's so hard, and God, you, you know, that's the mindset that pushes you away. It's the mindset that says, no, I can do all things, God paid a price, Jesus died for me, he loves me, it's the way that I move forward. You cannot move forward embracing accusation. When you have accusation in your mind or people in your life that are accusing you, trying to make you feel bad about your mistakes, making you feel bad about where you come from, making you try to look at all the stuff in your life, that all the problems, harassing you, telling you you can't do good enough, you're never going to be good enough. Look, if you, could, if you just were perfect in this one area, your life would be better. Come on, we all deal with this stuff. Sometimes you get people in your ear that just, eh, they just try to make you feel like you're not good enough. And the reality of that type of spirit is if you get down to it and get to know that person, I guarantee you they have a big insecurity in their life. They don't feel like they're good enough. But they try to play it like they are and they want to tell you. But the reality of it is there's probably insecurities in their own life that they're ignoring. We're not, doing, we're not trying to please God by doing all this work and trying to, you know, like, oh, we're going to have a ministry. We're going to do this. We're going to reach all these people. We're going to do all this stuff because we want to earn some kind of clout with God. No, we're doing it first and foremost because we love him. Because he loved us and because now that I've experienced that love, it causes me to go, God, I want to love you back. I want to love you back, God, so I give my life to you. I give my family to you. I give the cares of my life. I give all the things I, you know, you try to control your life and figure it out, make it all work. Come on, that pressure, that'll drive you to the wrong place. That'll put you in a place where you're, where you're leaning on other things besides God to try to bring you peace. Because the pressures of life, I just, I just don't think we were created to carry it. That's why you, you see people who are trying to carry it and they're stressed out and they're miserable. We're there to with God, work out our salvation with fear and trembling. We're there to walk with him. And then he deals with us as sons and daughters individually. He's not lumping us all together and, and trying to compare one another, you know. Well, here, I'm going to, here's Dennis and, and, uh, and here's uh, uh, <laughs> Pastor, two Dennises. They're the same and God's getting you guys confused. No, he knows each one. <laughs> He knows each one of your hearts. He knows each one of your journey, and he knows what he's put on the inside of you, and he deals with you according to your faith. That's why in the Bible, every time you see Jesus dealing with somebody who believes him, he says, let it be according to your faith, not according to your mommy and your daddy's faith. What's your faith? Where's your belief? Where's your God, it's you and I, and you love me, and you're my father, and I'm your son and daughter. And sometimes God comes in, and he corrects us, and he has to, you know, show us, okay, that's not my way. We're not going to live with those addictions and those things in your life because you're not going to be able to focus and go full forward with all that stuff. And then there's times where he, there's grace. He gives us grace. We're living by faith. For you have not, this is Hebrews 12, for you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and that burned with fire and to blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words so that those who heard it begged that the words should not be spoken to them anymore for they could not endure what was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow and so terrifying the sight that Moses said, I'm exceedingly afraid and trembling because of God's holiness and who he was. This is the Old Testament. There, was, there is an awe to God. There is a holiness. I mean, all you got to do and being in the, you know, from this, this side of town, tornado. Have you ever seen an actual tornado and the damage it can do? Have you ever seen those videos? Makes me want to get out of Texas, I'll tell you that much. Or, or Oklahoma. Or wherever tornadoes. They just had some in Tennessee, right? Arkansas. 
And I mean, it doesn't matter where you go, right? I'm from California. There's earthquakes. If you've ever been in one of those, those are scary too. You're just sitting there all of a sudden, you're like, whoa, what's going on? That there is a awe of the power of God. There is an awe to who he is. And there should be, you know, I'm not talking about, you know, you walk around thinking, oh, you know, God's going to kill you every moment of the day. But there should be a fear of the Lord that's in our life to knowing that, God, wow, you're, you're incredible. You're amazing. You know the details of every single person in this room. You know all their thoughts. You know every intention. You know everything about everyone. And you love all of us individually. You love all of us. You're not, there's not one God's looking at, God, oh, I love all them, but these guys over here I don't love. No, all they, he loves them, but all, what, what they need to do, right, is turn to him and have faith. That's all they need. They need to have faith and receive his love. And that's how you have your righteousness. That's how you put on the armor of God. And we showed last week that, that guy doing the pop and locking, right? He was doing all that. He's putting on the armor of God, and he's <clears throat> mimicking it because he has this faith that what he's actually doing, it, it's moving something. And I believe in the spirit it is moving something. Because it's our faith that moves God. It's the faith that we have that pleases him. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Oh, wait, I'm back up here, sorry. I am exceedingly afraid and trembling, but you have, not, you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. Do you know you have an innumerable company of angels that, that, are, that when you're with God, God has an army an invisible army on your side that if you get in agreement with him and his word, that there's actually forces that are unseen that get behind you to help you to accomplish what he has for you to do. But if you walk around with doubt and unbelief and you feel like, oh, it's never going to happen, that's the thing that will hinder your life. That will hinder you moving forward. But when you walk around going, I got, it's uh, like the story of Elisha where he has the, the prophet open his eyes and he goes, now look, and there's all these ar armies and chariots surrounding them. Because he opens to get him to see there's more for you than there are against you. When you're on God's side, there's nobody that can stand against you successfully because nobody can withstand or, or stand against God. You get in agreement with him and his plan and what he wants to do. It doesn't matter what the enemy throws at you. That's why we have to stand and doing all to stand. We stand there for with God's word and his truth around our waist. And we know because of that breastplate, we know. It's not, a pri it's not pride. We know we're greater than, better than everyone else. Yeah. It's not a pride. It's a righteousness and a right standing that when God says, hey, son, you go, yes, Abba. And there's no, there's no guilt. There's no shame. Hey, son. Well, you don't know what I did, God. You don't know who I am. You don't know all the bad things I did. And he's like, oh, gosh, we got to get through all this again. Well, I can't go back and die for you. You already died for you. I set you free. The price has been paid. What you got to do is you got to get that devil, that lie, that accusation broken off your life so that when God goes, hey, son, or hey, daughter, you look up and you go, yes, daddy, which is what Abba means. Yes, daddy. Are you ready? Let's go. Ready? Where are you? What, what's, what's the dream? What's the thing in your life that if you could do it, right? We think, well, if I had money, if I had all this stuff, if I had all these things. No, 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 no. You have God on your side. You don't need all what, what you're telling me. You got to have God plus stuff. You get God first. God will supply everything you need. God will make a way for you where there seems to be no way. He makes those crooked paths straight. He's on your side. He's for you. But you got to find out what that is. I'm not here to give you your assignment. I'm not God. You have to go to him and build a relationship. And then he tells you, hey, this is what I've called you to do. This is what I have for you. If all we're doing in life is just to make a living, to build a bank account up so we can buy a jacuzzi, right? Or we get to get a speedboat finally, get that fishing boat. And that's all life is. Come on, there's more to life than just that. There's got to be. For me, there's got to be. Because if my life is just about existing in this world, I mean, God's, 
He's marked me. I, I'm ruined forever. I can't look at life normal anymore. In fact, when I do, that's what depresses me. When I start seeing life like, oh, it's just normal and I got to be normal, heck to the no. Because I, I can't do it anymore. I got to, I'm separated into God. I got a purpose. I want to go where he wants me to go. I want to say what he wants me to say. Even if it costs me my life. Even if it costs me, I want to do it because that's what I'm living for. Because if I was living for this earth, then I think, well, let me just get everything I can because I got to enjoy every moment because I'm going to die and then my life's going to be over and then it's not going to be about me anymore. But it's not about me. It's about others and it's about his purpose. It's about what he's called us to. Romans 1, 16 through 17 says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in the righteousness of God, for in the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the, they, the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. We are just, we are righteous because of our faith in our Father, and our faith in what Jesus did for us. You don't have to try to earn that place with him. He's already given it to you. What you have to do is repent and change the way you think. Change the way that you think about your life, about God, about others. You, that's the biggest warfare that happens is right here in the mind. And we, we read that scripture last week where it talks about taking every thought captive because the enemy wants to get in here, and if he can manipulate, and, and, sh and even through religion, okay, dead religion that comes in and tries to change your mind, the next thing you know, you, go, you got all this information, but you got no power. Nobody gets led to Jesus. Nobody gets saved. Nobody's being discipled. We're just coming up and showing up in a building, but there's no evidence of who God is flowing through our life into the lives of others, where you have a testimony, because you were hanging out with so-and-so, and, -so and they were hurting or whatever, and you gave them a word of knowledge or you prayed for them, and God moved. And the next thing you know, their, their lives changed because you were obedient in a moment. God wants to use you. He's not just looking to call preachers and, you know, have them stand behind a pulpit and talk to people. I mean, the reality of, of ministry happens on a greater level than just me speaking words to you. It's got to get down on the inside of you. And there's got to be sometimes some wrestling and some, you know, the enemy's trying to get in and we got to push them out and say, no, devil, you don't have a place in this person's life. You don't get to win. And we get to stand with God and see people delivered and set free. Amen. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Let me get back to my notes here. We already read that one. Okay, our Christ's blood speaks a better word. That's Hebrew. Uh, let me get go to that one. Sorry. I'm, here we go. For you have come to Mount Zion, a city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly of the church, of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, made perfect to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks a better things than that of Abel. The blood of Abel, who was murdered by Cain, right, because his brother was jealous of his sacrifice, and so he killed him. Well, his blood, what? Speak, spoke guilty. Guilty. But the blood of Jesus speaks redeemed. The blood of Jesus speaks accepted, righteous, guiltless. The blood of Jesus speaks a better word over your life today. Of freedom, of victory. Victory from sin, but also victory over the devil and what he's trying to do in your life where he's trying to get your focus off of the things of God and put them on the world or put them on you and you just selfish and thinking about yourself all the time. 
God wants you actually to, you know, life is much bigger than just us. We got we to gotta break out of that mentality and be open to God. It's about others. It's about children that don't have any parents. It's about that little baby who's born into a, a situation that's broken and they're crying and they're hungry and they have nobody. And let me tell you, the world system, they can't take care of them. In fact, you hear about that, that system and you want to throw up because you see people go into that foster care system and they're just abused. And then you have people working it, manipulating it, trying to make money off of it instead of actually helping and equipping and taking care of the kids. There's good people, and then there's bad people with bad motives, and the enemy uses those people to abuse and to get kids so turnt and so rebellious and so angry at life and so angry at their circumstances that they just go out and they want to destroy and they hate, and they hate people, and they just, they hate their lives, they hate their selves. There's no love because they haven't been loved. And so it takes somebody full of God full of love to come into their life and to put seeds of love and to walk through them through their pain and through their anguish and through their rage and their rejection because people that were there supposed to love them, they weren't there for them. So it hurts because of rejection. But see, you and I, we know somebody who doesn't reject us. In fact, he loves us with an everlasting love, a powerful love, a love that breaks in and breaks off every chain and actually empowers us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. The Bible says, no weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. And it says every tongue that rises against you in judgment, you shall show to be in the wrong. I love the amplified version of this because it, it kind of amplifies it. Every tongue that shall rise against you in judgment, you shall show to be in the wrong. This peace, righteousness, security, triumph over opposition is the heritage of of the servants of the Lord. Those in whom the ideal servant of the Lord is reproduced. You are a reproduction of God's glory and his purpose. When you give your life to Jesus, you now are, you're saying, God, you're my Lord, you're my Savior, and it doesn't stop there. See, this is what watered-down Christianity teaches people. It teaches people that it stops right there. Well, now you're saved. No, Christianity comes now and says, okay, now I'm going to reproduce in you my son. I'm going to put the spirit of God on the inside of you, and he's going to begin to work and get rid of all the, the immaturities, the things that are wrong, the impurities. He's going to purify on the inside those things, and he's going to line us up with his assignment. And he, and he says, those in whom the ideal servant of the Lord is reproduced, this is the righteousness or the vindication which they attained from me, that is that which I impart to them as their justification, says the Lord. His righteousness imparted to you. Him saying, you are free, you are guiltless. The judge came and was going to sentence you, and Jesus stood in the way and said, nope, I'll take the blame so that you can be free. You are accepted in the beloved. Blessed be the God of our, and our Father, Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him through the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame before him in love, having predestined us to the adoption as sons by Jesus Christ himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. We are accepted in Christ. 
Our righteousness is not from men. Our righteousness does not come from our family, our heritage, our bloodline. You know, some people are so hyped up on their last name, right? They think their last name is so wonderful, and I'm a this, and I'm a that. My, you know, and they, they tout it everywhere. And then you find out, you go down the family line, and then you find corruption and sin and evil and all kinds of heck. And then they put you on Netflix and make a documentary about you. <laughs> you know, people who are proud of their last names. I'm an archer. Way back in the day, we used to shoot people with arrows. <laughs> it's just, you know, it's silly. I'd rather identify with Christ, with Jesus, with the Son of God than, than my family. And I love my family. Okay, don't get me wrong. But that name or that history doesn't supersede God's plan, his purpose for my life. I take the good, but I spit out the bad. Because I'm, I'm not trying to be like my, my dad or my mom. I want to be like Jesus. And I love my dad and my mom. But my assignment is not to conform to the image of my parents. It's to conform to the image of the son. Of Jesus and what does that look like he's loving he's humble he's he's sweet he's kind but you know what else he is he's righteous and he's he's full of fire if you read revelations it talks about his eyes are like fire and he's coming back and he's coming on a horse and he's coming he's coming to take all those who are his well, thank you, Lord, for this morning, for your word. I have a little bit more, but I'm going to go ahead and stop because we're coming down to the end here. I'll read, a, I'll read one more. Isaiah 59 says this. It says, he saw there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his own arm brought salvation for him and his own righteousness. It sustained him for he put on righteousness as a breastplate. And a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of, vis of vengeance for clothing. And was clad with zeal as a cloak. According to their deeds, according he, accordingly he will repay. Fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies. The coastland he will fully repay. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west. And his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. The, the Redeemer will come to Zion, and to those who turn from transgression to Jacob, says the Lord. As for me, says the Lord, this is my covenant with them. My spirit who is upon you, and my words which I have put in your mouth, shall not depart from your mouth, nor from the mouth of your descendants, nor from the mouth, uh, from the mouth of your descendants' descendants, says the Lord, from this time and forevermore. God's call, his purpose. It's not to duplicate your family line without God. It's to duplicate God in you. And your children carry it. And your children's children carry it. They carry the assignment and the purpose of God until the end. Until it's over. And what he's talking about is he's not coming as just this, Hi guys, I'm Jesus. I'm here to redeem everyone and save everyone. Those of you who are sweet and kind like me, you're going to go to heaven. Right? I don't, I don't look at Jesus that way. I look at him as a king who has authority, who comes with righteousness. Righteousness isn't just right standing with God. It's an assignment to what? To destroy and push out everything that's not righteous. Everything that's impure and unholy, righteousness exposes. So that breastplate doesn't just come to make you right with God, it comes to expose every hidden thought, every hidden agenda, every motive that's not of God. It comes to reveal it in our lives so that we can get alignment, say, God, whatever's impure in me, you can remove it, you can burn it out, whatever needs to happen, form me into the fashion of your son so that I can carry your spirit with zeal and fervor and not just carry it with a religious cloak Right? I got the religious breastplate of righteousness, which is just an outward looking and adornment, but on the inside, 
That's what he called the Pharisees and Sadducees, right? He said, you guys, are the, outs, the outside looks good, but on the inside, you're, there's all kinds of wickedness and evil and stuff that's going on that, that men can't see, but God sees. And so righteousness comes to expose. 